<laughs> All right, so picture this. You're feeling on top of the world, right? Maybe you're crushing it at the gym, feeling invincible. <laughs> and then out of nowhere, bam, your heart decides to throw a curveball, a big one. And this, my friend, is the kind of scary scenario we're talking about today with Brugada syndrome. This is a silent, often invisible heart condition. And today we are going deep, deep down to really understand it. Now you might be thinking, okay, but is this even relevant to me? And you know what? Fair question. Whether you're a medical whiz getting ready for a big presentation or just someone who, like us, gets a kick out of unraveling complex things, this deep dive is for you. We're going to be talking peculiar EKG patterns, a genetic puzzle, and why this condition seems to pick its, well, its victims so specifically. So let's start at the very beginning, yeah? What is Brugada syndrome? In the simplest terms possible, it's a genetic heart condition that can lead to super dangerous, sometimes even fatal heart rhythms. And what's interesting here is it's a pretty new discovery in the medical world. It was actually the Brugada brothers, yep, you heard that right, who first described it back in 1992. But even though it's relatively new to medicine, understanding Brugada syndrome has become absolutely crucial, especially when we consider its role in, well, sudden cardiac death. And often these deaths occur in people who, on the surface, seem perfectly healthy. See, that's what makes Brugada so, so tricky. You could have zero symptoms, like literally no warning signs, and then boom, a major cardiac event. It's almost like a ticking time bomb that you don't even know is there. Absolutely. And to make things even more complex, a good number of people with Brugada syndrome have absolutely no family history of sudden cardiac death. Imagine trying to put together a puzzle where half the pieces are missing. That's the challenge doctors are up against. That's wild. I mean, it's like trying to predict the unpredictable. I read that a staggering 72% of people with Brugada syndrome won't experience any symptoms. That's almost three quarters. And that right there is exactly why we're here today, to give you the information, the knowledge, to understand this silent threat. Okay, so we've talked about how Brugada syndrome can be, well, pretty stealthy. But what's actually happening inside the heart? when someone has this condition. Let's kind of like zoom in and get a closer look. It's like a glitch in the heart's electrical system. You know, our hearts beat to a very specific rhythm and that rhythm is controlled by electrical signals. And with Brugada syndrome, those signals get disrupted primarily in the right ventricle, which is one of the heart's main pumping chambers. So it's like the electrical wiring in the heart isn't quite right. And I'm guessing that's where the genetic component comes in, right? Like a, yeah. there's a specific gene that's involved. Exactly. The gene is called SCN5A, and this gene is responsible for creating a protein that plays a really crucial role in regulating sodium flow in our heart cells. Think of it this way. Sodium channels are like tiny little gateways that control the flow of electrical signals in the heart. Okay, so sodium electrical signals starting to paint a picture here. Good. So when there's a mutation in the SCN5A gene, it basically messes up the normal function of these sodium channels. And because those channels are responsible for those electrical signals, well, the signals get disrupted. And that's what can lead to those dangerous, irregular heartbeats that we've been talking about. So it's like these gene mutations are kind of like typos in the heart's electrical instruction manual. Okay. And this is where it gets even more interesting for me because researchers are still trying to completely understand exactly how this all works. Right? Make you got it. Yeah. That's the million dollar question. <laughs> it's like having some of the puzzle pieces, but not the whole picture. Right now, there are two main theories that scientists are exploring to explain how these gene mutations lead to Brugada syndrome. We call them the repolarization disorder model and the depolarization disorder model. Two models. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to need you to break those down for me. So imagine your heart's electrical activity as a wave, right? The repolarization model really focuses on how this wave kind of recovers after each beat. And this is especially important in the right ventricle, as we talked about earlier. In Brugada syndrome, this recovery phase, the repolarization, it gets messed up, like a wave that crashes too early before it's supposed to. Got it. Okay, so what about the depolarization model? What's that one all about? The depolarization model, on the other hand, looks at the beginning of that electrical wave, how it starts and spreads through the heart. This model suggests that in Brugada syndrome, there's a delay in the beginning of that process, particularly in the right ventricle. Imagine a traffic jam, but instead of cars, it's the electrical signals in your heart. That's a really helpful way to think about it. So both of these models are trying to explain why the electrical activity in the right ventricle goes haywire and how that can lead to those life-threatening heart rhythms. But how do doctors actually see these electrical problems? How do they even know if someone has Brugada syndrome in the first place? 
That's where the electrocardiogram, better known as the EKG, comes in. It's like a window into the heart's electrical activity, and it's really the key to diagnosing Brugada syndrome. So the EKG is kind of like analyzing your heart's own electrical signature. What exactly is it telling us about Brugada syndrome? Like, what are doctors specifically looking for in those wavy lines? They're looking for very specific patterns in those electrical waves. You can almost imagine the EKG reading as a heartbeat silhouette, right? And in Brugada syndrome, the silhouette has these unusual spikes, kind of like sharp mountain peaks instead of gentle rolling hills. We call these spikes coved ST elevations, and they're a major red flag for doctors. Gotcha. So it's like the EKG is showing this distinct fingerprint that basically screams Brugada. Exactly. And there are actually three main types, type I, type 2, and type 3. Each one has its own, you know, its own slight variation on that distinctive EKG pattern. Ah, so different, I guess you could say. Different flavors of the same condition. But here's what I find really wild and maybe a little scary. Sometimes Brugada syndrome can be hiding in plain sight. You're telling me someone can have this condition and the EKG won't show anything. It's true. In some cases, that initial EKG might look totally normal. It's not until doctors do what's called a drug challenge test that the telltale signs of Brugada syndrome actually show up. A drug challenge. Okay, you got to tell me more about this. What is that exactly? Sure. So basically, it involves giving the patient a medication, usually a sodium channel blocker. And remember those sodium channels we talked about before? Well, this medication temporarily accentuates any electrical abnormalities that are happening in the heart. It's kind of like turning up the volume on a really faint radio signal makes it much easier to pick up. That's fascinating. It's like the heart is holding on to its secrets and doctors have to use this like this clever trick to get them out in the open. So the Trud Challenge test helps uncover hidden Brugada syndrome. Are there any other ways to, you know, confirm a diagnosis? What about genetic testing? You're right on track. Genetic testing can be super helpful, especially if there's a family history of Brugada syndrome. And sometimes doctors will also use invasive electrophysiology studies where they actually thread these very thin catheters into the heart to map out its electrical activity in even greater detail. Wow, that's incredible, the lengths they go to to really understand what's going on. So we've talked about what's happening inside the heart, the genetic link, and how doctors even go about diagnosing Brugada syndrome. But what can you actually do about it? Like, what's the treatment look like for something as serious as this? Because Brugada syndrome carries this risk of sudden cardiac arrest, yeah, treatment is absolutely critical. The cornerstone of treatment is a device called an implantable cardioverter defibrillator, or ICD for short. Uh, ICD. Yeah, I've heard of those. It's an amazing piece of technology, really. Basically, it's a small device that gets implanted under the skin, and it constantly monitors the heart's rhythm. If it detects a life-threatening arrhythmia, it delivers a small electric shock, which helps to reset the heart back to a normal rhythm. Wow. So it's like having a personal bodyguard for your heart, always on call and ready to step in if needed. That's a great way to put it. Are there other treatment options available too? Like, what if someone can have an ICD or if they need additional support? Medications can definitely play a role as well. There's a drug called quinidine, and it's shown a lot of promise in reducing the risk of dangerous heart rhythms, particularly for people who have ICDs and experience, you know, multiple shocks. Ah, that makes sense. Huh. What about new treatments on the horizon? Anything exciting in the works? Oh, there's always research going on, which is exciting. One promising area is radiofrequency ablation. It's a minimally invasive procedure, and it uses heat to basically destroy very small areas of heart tissue that are causing those electrical disturbances. So it's like giving those faulty electrical circuits a little reset. Exactly. That's really encouraging to hear. It sounds like the treatment landscape for Brugada syndrome is constantly evolving. It absolutely is. And that's why it's so important for patients and their doctors to work together, you know, to really determine the best course of action. There's no one size fits all approach, right? The best treatment plan depends on individual risk factors, personal preferences, and of course, the latest advancements in care. That's a really good point. Well, there you have it. We've taken a deep, deep dive into this world of Brugada syndrome. We started with its, well, its stealthy nature, its genetic underpinnings, and then got into those cutting-edge diagnostic tools and treatment options. What are your final thoughts for our listeners today? You know, Brugada syndrome, it might be a silent threat, but as we've learned today, knowledge is power. By understanding this condition, its causes, the symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and the treatment options, we empower ourselves and we empower the medical community to better protect hearts and save lives. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today. 
And to everyone listening, if this deep dive has sparked your curiosity, don't stop here. There's an entire world of information out there waiting to be explored. Maybe look into the latest research on genetic testing for Brugada syndrome, or even read about the experiences of those who are living with this condition. You never know what you might discover. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive into, well, into the heart of a silent threat.